Kingdom advancement. It's very powerful too to say that your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. This is important to think about, especially when you're praying for the sick. There's no sick people in heaven. You're praying for His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no sin in heaven. So you're praying that what is happening in heaven will happen upon this earth. Jesus is awesome. Awesome. Let's pray. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Father, that your word changes us and transforms us and gives us direction and corrects us and reveals to us who we we really are and shows us who you are, Father. And help us just walk in your ways. Help us understand your, your wisdom and your word. Better than ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, guys. So uh, this is going to be Kingdom. This is going to be Authority of the Believer series, part five. Kingdom advancement. Uh Uh-oh. Kingdom advancement. <clears throat> now, uh, we've been talking about this last one. We talked about seated with Christ. And, uh, you know, talking about how Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Um, and I want to just kind of comment on this a little bit. You know, there were some things I was suggesting. I don't want to go into like heresy. Okay, so I want to be careful. What we're saying here. I'm not saying that we are God or that we are Jesus. My point in the teachings is to explain how authority happens, that our authority comes from authority. Jesus Christ, his own authority, also came from authority. And again, we've seen that in the teaching, plenty of scriptures that, that show us that the Father is greater than the Son and that the Son even will have dominion over everything, but he will give everything back to the Father, right? So there's clear uh, chain of command in in the, even in the even in what we understand as the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There is actually chain of command, which is interesting. Okay, um, and the same thing goes with us. You know, and I mentioned <clears throat> how we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, and then there's a place that talks about um, Jesus, uh, how he's how he puts his his sheep on the right side, and I kind of like side mentioned that. You know, I want to kind of expound a little bit on that. First of all, you have to understand whenever the sheep were on the right side and the goats were on the left side, they were there for judgment. So let's just clarify that. They were there for judgment. You cannot be judged for something that you're not held responsible for. You can't be held responsible for something that you're not given responsibility over. And you're not given responsibility over something you'll never, you're not given authority over. Okay? Okay. So you ever heard that phrase by Peter Parker's uncle? With great power comes great responsibility. (laughs) We have been given authority over this earth and we will be held accountable one day to what we do or do not do with it. Okay? So I just kind of wanted to mention that because I felt like I didn't do a good enough job in the last teaching explaining that and uh, i don't want people thinking that just because we have dominion or authority just because you have dominion and authority doesn't mean that you don't answer to someone see a lot of times people think well oh you're saying we have authority over the earth are you telling us that we're like god well first of all we are like god because we're made in his image period he was a ruler and reigner and a king over the earth and so yeah he makes us rulers and reigners over this earth as well so yeah I'm saying that, but I'm not saying that we are God. <clears throat> it's funny to me that people who are religious and have a hard time understanding this concept, they're going to say things like, well, I can't believe that you're saying uh, you know, that we have that type of authority. No, actually what I'm saying is you're going to be held accountable. That's what I'm saying. God gives you authority because you're going to be held accountable. Or you're going to be held accountable. Therefore, you have authority. Therefore, you're going to be held 
accountable. You can't be held accountable to, to something that you're not responsible for. Am I making sense? <clears throat> you can't be judged for something that you weren't given power over. Okay? So it's actually not really saying that we have... See, people, when they talk about authority, they think autonomy. That's not how authority works. They are not the same thing. Authority and autonomy are not the same thing. What autonomy means is you don't answer to somebody. That is not how this world works at all. Everybody thinks, well, I want freedom. I want to be my own boss. It's not how it works. Even if you own your own business, you still have a boss. It's the customer. You still have to answer somebody. You always have to answer somebody, no matter what. It's the people who move up. The people who move up the highest in life are the ones who truly understand what it means to answer someone, to be held accountable. It's actually the fleeing of accountability that causes you to lose power and dominion over your life. It's when you run into accountability that you actually gain more power and dominion in your life. The point of the teaching isn't to say, oh, you've been given authority and you don't have to answer somebody. You know, the point is God has given you authority. Therefore, you will answer him on how you handled what he gave you. That's the point. Like, I think what people don't understand is it's because you're going to answer him one day that you must do a good job. You must take authority. You must take responsibility because it doesn't matter whether you like it or not you have to answer God for how you handle it that's why people say man you know <clears throat> uh, people talk about husbands being the head of the house right people don't like this husbands being the head of the home well first of all it doesn't really matter what you like it doesn't really matter if, if we like the fact that husbands are the head of the home or not. The fact is, God created it this way, period, and you're going to have to answer God. I'm not going to have to answer my wife for whether I'm going to be the head of the home or not. I'm going to have to answer God. My authority doesn't come from my wife. My authority comes from God. That makes sense? It, it, it's like being in the military. If, if, if an E5 goes to an E3, the E3 is like, I don't like you being my boss. It doesn't really matter. The E7 and above, they're the ones who are, who are doing this, for putting E5s in there, right? <laughs> they're the ones who put those people in charge. And it doesn't really matter what the subordinates, and I say subordinates, I'm not trying to, it's, it's a hard way of saying that. People really don't like that word. You know why we don't like the word subordinate? Because we're rebellious. The reason why we don't like the word subordinate is because we're rebellious. I'm going to say it again. The reason why we don't like the word subordinate is because we're rebellious and we don't understand our authority. You won't understand your authority until you understand the authority that's over you. You won't understand what's been given to you until you, what's been, until you understand who you're submitting to. We don't like the word servant because we're rebellious. Jesus said this of himself. He says, the Son of Man didn't even come to be served, but came to serve. It's the highest authorities in life. The people who really move to the highest authorities in life are the ones who truly understand the concept of being a servant. You never become truly in charge until you learn how to submit. It's submission which is key to victory in every area of your life. I'm saying a whole lot here. Whenever we want to cast off the authority, we lose our own authority. Let me say that again. If you want to cast off your authority that's above you, you lose your own authority. And you can't throw off the highest authority because the highest authority will always remain the highest authority and he'll hold us accountable for taking responsibility for something that wasn't ours. 
If you try to take on something that's not yours, you'll be held accountable for that. And you won't like it because you won't know how to handle it because it was never given to you in the first place. God didn't grace you to be the, to take care of that type of authority, but you took it anyway. Now you have to take responsibility for it. It's powerful stuff. I said a whole lot there by the power of God because I don't remember what I said. I'm going to have to watch this teaching again. <clears throat> It's the authority that comes from authority. If we, if, we, if we shove or shrub off what God has established, then we ourselves lose our own power and our own dominion and we'll be answerable for something that we were never designed to be answered before because we took on something that didn't belong to us. Does that make sense? We've got to learn how to submit. When we learn to submit, then God gives us more authority. Now, that's a strange thing to hear. But that's why the Bible says God exalts the humble. God exalts the humble. It's so important to remember this. God exalts the humble. Again, it's not autonomy. Everybody thinks autonomy, autonomy is whenever you don't answer to someone. Autonomy is when you don't answer to someone. That's not what authority is. Authority is submission. It's submission to authority. It's to people who don't understand that that never actually get victory in their life. Let me say this again. It's to people who want to shrub off the authority. They want autonomy. They don't want to answer anybody. Those people always lose. Let me say that again. When we want to shove off the authority in our life, we always lose. Am I making sense? It's very strange that happens. <clears throat> authority is power. Okay? We become powerless when we throw off those who are in power over us. It's a very strange thing to say, <laughs> but it's the truth. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying that if you have an ungodly authority, right? We're not talking about throwing off ungodly authority. We're talking about throwing off godly authority. If you throw off godly authority in your life, you lose your power. If you have submitted yourself to ungodly authority, the only way to get victory is to throw off that ungodly authority because that's not God's will for you. Because the ungodly authority, which would be the devil, okay, because it doesn't matter what, see, what we don't understand is you are servants by nature. Let me say this again. We are servants by nature. <laughs> you will, let me say this. You are servants by nature. You will never, ever, doesn't matter how much we think in our brain that we're going to shove off authority, you will never, ever not be a servant. It just depends on who you're serving. Are you serving God or are you serving the devil? <clears throat> it is like a magnet. A magnet has to be, it, they attract to each other. It's, it's the way it is, okay? It, it's like fire is hot. It's like ice is cold. It's in your nature. We are designed to serve. We are created to serve. God created a mar we created the marker to write. We created the battery to charge. We created the paper to record, the camera to record. These things they are by nature. It's that by design that they do these things. Okay. Why? God has a great purpose for your life. He has a great purpose for your life. And yes, we have this authority, but that authority only comes through serving. The authority that you have only comes through serving. <clears throat> Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. 
It doesn't matter. If you try to throw off godly authority, then what happens is you put on ungodly authority and you start to submit to the devil. Okay? Um, I don't know how to describe it. A, a porcupine will never stop being pokey. <laughs> a skunk will never stop being stinky. You know what I mean? We will always be servants. The difference is when we submit to God, see, people just don't get it. They just don't get how it works. They think they can rule and reign without submitting. It's not how it works. <laughs> it's such an interesting concept. But this is why Jesus said this, the least among you will be the greatest. The least among you will be the greatest. The servant of all. So, I, I, mm, so good. It's when you give and sacrifice yourself. That God brings us such victory in our lives. Hmm. You'll never be able to accomplish what God has for you until you fully embrace who you really are, and that is primarily a servant. The Bible says it's a slave. That's even worse. Culturally speaking, our minds are so offended by the word slave. We are offended. If you're offended by the word slave, you won't have victory in your life. <laughs> Ow. Why? Because we correlate the word slave with a bad master. We correlate the word slave with a bad master. A slave. You, you, you hear the word slave, culturally speaking, we're in America where slavery was abolished, right? <clears throat> So you hear the word slavery and you immediately think, immediately think of a whip and being beat as a slave. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so that's not what I'm talking about. If you want to talk about the devil, <laughs> so you are already a slave, the Bible says. You're a slave to sin. Yeah, that's why we don't like the word slave. But you you can't be <laughs> If you're owned by the devil, the only way for you to get out is somebody buys you. If you belong to the devil and you're a slave to him, the only way to get out is if somebody buys you. God has purchased us with his very precious blood. We've been purchased. We belong to God. It's, it's the desire to cast off that restraint it causes us to enter into sin and someone more mighty than us will take over. If, see, what happens is our power and our dominion comes from God. And so when we cast off restraint from God, then we lose our power. And, and you're powerless to the devil. So the devil is more power. There's a place called Guam. Have you ever heard of Guam? Yeah. They're a rebellious people. <laughs> Now, I ain't never been to Guam. My, re my sources come from a person who's stationed there right now. All right? So bear with me. If I got some things wrong, I'm sorry, but I'm using it for illustration purposes. But Guam is a tiny little island. It has no power in its own. It has been ruled and, and, and conquered by nation after nation. Before uh, America had it, it was conquered by Japan. And they were ruthless to this island. They were ruthless to this island. So America comes in when, after World War II and takes over Guam. You know that Guam doesn't, they don't have the rights that you and me have. They're a territory. They're not a state. <laughs> They're a territory. Guam is like us. They have no power in and of themselves. If Guam wanted to rebel, 
We'd have to just be nice and let them go away. They would not be able to overthrow us. It's not possible. We have to let them just let it go. But what would happen if America decided to let go of Guam? Japan or somebody. Somebody more powerful than Guam would come take over. Why? Because Guam is in a strategic military position. <laughs> you are like Guam. You're weak, and you're in a you are in a strategic military position. <laughs> You are a very powerful asset to one kingdom or the other. And someone more powerful than you will come and rule your life. Either God or the devil. <laughs> powerful stuff. So Guam right now, they have, you know, you know, right, they have protests and stuff. They want to be their own nation again or or some of them want at least rights, right? Because they want to be able to vote, right? I'm not saying that they shouldn't have some voting capabilities or whatever. But again, you're talking about America and American politics. And we're not talking about American politics. We're talking about kingdom politics. And in the kingdom, there's no voting. <laughs> He's the king. It's a monarchy. <laughs> you don't get to pick. Why? Because he's infinitely more wise than we are. Guam. It's a great, great picture. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for this picture. We are weak in and of ourselves. And we are a strategic military position. The enemy wants us, Satan wants us, or God wants us. Yeah, he already has us. That's why God came to invade. And, and, and he came in to take over and drive the devil out. It's powerful stuff. Powerful, powerful, powerful. And... I mean, Guam, I said Guam is a strategic military position. That means that there's some serious missions that come out of Guam. Some serious military decisions. You're the same way. God has created you to use you in a powerful military way. This is why when God created man, he put him on the earth and said, subdue it. Subdue it from what? The devil was, I think the devil was already here. <clears throat> he had created us to come and take over this world. Powerful stuff. But it wasn't for our own sake. It wasn't so that we could have our own kingdom. So that we could rule and reign in his kingdom. Making sense? All right. Luke, we'll go over to use some scripture now, okay? Luke chapter 11. Verse 1. <clears throat> now Jesus was praying in a certain place when he finished. One of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. All right, I want to explain something here. A lot of people don't understand the importance of prayer. Jesus tells us the point of prayer in his answer to their question. Everybody thinks that prayer, I don't know what people think prayer is. Some wishful thinking? When they say, you're in my prayers, what they really mean is, I've been thinking about you? Maybe. <laughs> most, when most people say, you're in my prayers, they're just saying, I'm thinking about you right now. But you weren't, they weren't praying for you. <laughs> just saying. It's a kind gesture. People are lazy. Prayer. What is prayer? The primary purpose of prayer is to release the kingdom of God upon this earth.
you need to know your weapon. If you are in a military, you got to learn how to use your weapon. God's word, the Bible says, is the sword. Prayer is how you wield it. Let me say that again. The word of God is your sword. Prayer is how you wield it. Why do we know this? The kingdom of God is the king's... <coughs> Domain. When you hear king dumb, it comes from the two words king's domain. It's where he rules and reigns. We will release the kingdom of God upon the earth. <clears throat> Everybody says, well, God is the ruler of the whole earth. Yes and no. He is the divinely ordained, established coming king upon this earth. But the scripture teaches us also that the devil is the god of this world. How can God be the god of this world and the devil be the god of this world? It doesn't make any sense. It's There's a battle taking place. Why would Jesus tell us your kingdom come if it was already here? There's a measure, a mystery, I should say, behind the fact that his kingdom is coming. But at the same time, he looked at him and said, the kingdom of God is within you, or the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God can be here, but it needs to invade here too. The kingdom of God is present, but it must take over. A kingdom of God is wherever his people are standing. And the people of God have to stand against the devil. And so we can come, and the kingdom of God can be in the same room as the kingdom of the devil. But the kingdom of God must push against the kingdom of the devil. So there's a, an advancement. There's a driving out that has to take place. Okay, The king's domain. All right? When you pray, you release the kingdom, the king's domain, upon the earth. Okay? God's word is your sword, and the way you wield it is through prayer. What you're doing is, when you pray, you're speaking the will of God. This is why the Bible says, we know that he hears us when we pray the will of God. What is he meaning? It's your job to know the will of God. It's your job to study this word. You can't be praying that your wife will die of cancer so you can go marry Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> or whatever it is. <laughs> Kenneth Hagin, I don't know his name, but I get those guys mixed up. There was a lady that prayed. That was uh, She was like, believe it to receive! And she started praying that um, Ken Copeland's uh, wife would die so she could marry him. You know? That's not the will of God. You can't be praying things that are against the will of God. Okay? Uh, let me, okay, let me clarify this. When you pray in faith and believe for something that's not the Word of God, that's called witchcraft. Okay? That's praying to the wrong master, right? That's praying to the wrong master. Okay? It's called witchcraft. You can pray. If you pray for something that's not the will of God, that's called witchcraft. And so we know witchcraft is real. We've seen witchcraft in the Bible. We saw that there was a girl that was prophesying and saying things. Oh, this is the this is Paul. He's preaching the way of the kingdom, the way of God, the Christ, right? He's preaching the Messiah. Three days later, he cast the devil out of her. So the devil can sure sound a whole lot like the truth, but it's just, there's something behind it. I have to be careful about. <clears throat> um, prayer. Prayer's primary purpose is to release the kingdom of God. That's why he said, your kingdom come. When you pray, pray like this. So we see, Father, hallowed be your name. We see worship in there, okay? Worship. We see kingdom release. Okay, well, we're focusing here. 
is, uh, but worship is submission. Again, you're yielding to that kingdom. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so prayer is, in prayer we submit and in prayer we release. In prayer we submit and in prayer we release. Why do we know this? Because James, the book of James says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. What's the key to release to, to resisting the devil? Submitting to God. So we submit to God, who is our authority, who gives us authority over the devil. Make sense? You people want to resist the devil, but they don't want to submit to God. You're not that's not gonna work. <laughs> They, people want to have victory in their life over the devil and what he's doing in their lives, but they don't want to submit to God. That don't work. You got to submit to God, then resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. Release the kingdom of God. We have to study our word. We have to study the word of God. This is the sword. You are in a battle to, kingdom, to advance the kingdom of God. If you don't know the word of God, how can you pray God's will Upon the earth. <laughs> Matthew 6, 10. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Um, your kingdom come. Watch this. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Kingdom advancement. It's very powerful, too, to say that your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. This is important to think about, especially when you're praying for the sick. There's no sick people in heaven. You're praying for His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no sin in heaven. Right? Right? So you're praying that what is happening in heaven will happen upon this earth. Powerful stuff. We are commanded to pray. Why don't people pray? Because they think that whatever's going to happen is going to happen. They think that God's God is in control, God's will, God's sovereignty. All these things that were actually designed to give you power in your prayer, they used to remove your power in prayer. Isn't that interesting? God's sovereignty. You know what sovereignty means? The right to rule and reign. That's it. Soul right? Soul right to, to rule and reign, as in the only right to rule and reign. Well, I mean, you have different states out there that have sovereign, they're the sovereign state of, you know, I don't know, the Bahamas, I don't know, Bahamas I think belong to America, I don't know, <laughs> I can't remember. But there's the sovereign state of Israel, right? The right, the, the right to rule and reign over, them, over that particular area. Um, so when we say God is sovereign, what we're saying that He is, is He has a right to rule and reign. He has... The power and the dominion to rule and reign. So when we submit to God's sovereignty, what most of the time people think is they're submitting to God doing whatever He wants with or without you. And that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us very clearly He wants to co-labor with us. God doesn't do anything on the earth without men. It's not about God going to do whatever He wants to do. If that's the case, then what, why am I even here? What's the purpose in even existing? God wants to use you. There's a reason why we'll be judged for neglecting those who are naked, neglecting those who were in prison, neglecting those who were sick, neglecting the hungry, right? Why? Because God chose to use you. He wants to use you to minister to the least of these. <clears throat> but we say, well, it's not God's sovereign, so whatever's going to happen is going to happen. That's not what the sovereignty means. It's the same reason why people want to defund the police, because they think that they're in control. They're not in control. They respond to evil, is what they do. But the police aren't preventing evil. They arrest evil. They go stop evil after it's already started. Same thing with God. God doesn't judge you before you sin. Then we have weird end of the end of world movies like artificial intelligence. 
where some robot predicts everybody's behavior and then kills them all. That's not God. If that was happening, then we'd already be dead already. All of us. <laughs> no, he's a, God is a God of redemption. This is why God's wisdom is greater than AI. <laughs> God wasn't out to destroy everyone. He's come to save everyone. God, this is the backward side. You know, like we think, we think that justice is to prevent sin. Justice is to take something that's broken and fix it. It's not preventing the sin. What makes God good isn't that he prevents sin. Isn't that he prevents evil? What makes God good is that he redeems those who were evil. He fixes those that were broken. Powerful stuff. You want to know why the atheist doesn't believe in God? It's because if they were God, they would control everything. You know why God doesn't... They, but they have fashioned a God in their own image. Saying, if, if, if God was good, what they really meant was, if God was like me, because they're defining good by their own character. If God was good, he would stop evil before it happened. You mean you would be an, a, 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 a dictator? Well, what's the difference between being a king and a dictator, Zach? There is a difference. King serves. A dictator kills everyone who's against him uh, whenever he suspects them of evil before they've even done it. Just look at Saddam. Saddam Hussein would take all the people he thought would be evil towards him and kill them all. Dictators are paranoid. Watch this. Dictators are paranoid. Now, I'm not saying dictator like... Let me rephrase this. The word dictator does not mean paranoid. I guess you could have a dictator out there that's not paranoid. Okay? But the dictators that we're experiencing in the past, according to our experience and our history, they are paranoid. Okay? Why? They want absolute control. What is that, what is that desire for absolute control? It's driven by fear. So let me explain this. You can have bad shepherds and good shepherds. The word shepherd itself is not evil or good. It's how do they shepherd. Same thing with the word dictator. Even though I know we live in America, everybody's going to stone me for saying this. But you can have a president that's good or a president that's bad. You can have a dictator that is good. If there is one. I don't know if we've ever seen one. But hypothetically, you could have... A good dictator, right? Hypothetically, you could have a good king, right? Say, am I making sense here a little bit? I'm saying the word itself doesn't have an evil or or bad connotation. It's when someone who's ruled by the devil that makes that word bad. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me explain. I think I've explained that well enough. But dictators in the past, the reason why they we call them dictators is because they have absolute control, driven by fear. That's my point. We call them dictators. Well, you're a dictator. So the word dictator has become an evil connotation. Right? You're a dictator. It's because the dictators we've seen have had absolute control. They live completely out of paranoia. And they just kill everybody who they think is against them. They're insecure. Their ruling and reigning comes from insecurity. Am I making sense? <clears throat> they come from insecurity. God's not insecure. God's not worried about his kingdom being overthrown. You see what I'm saying? That's why he doesn't stop sin before it happens. Why, what makes God good isn't that he prevents sin. What makes God good is that he judges sin and that he redeems those who humble themselves. That's what makes God good. Is that he's loving that he sees us in our flaws anyway, and says, hmm, 
Is there hope for him? Yeah, there's hope for him. Powerful stuff. See, am I making sense about the whole atheist thing? The atheist wants to fashion a God after his own image. If he was God, he would have prevented all the sin. But what was sin? It's whatever he defines it as. So the same atheist is shacking up with the girlfriend <laughs> and not committed to her and, and, and married. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> we have a double standard. The real problem is that we want God to judge sin, but we don't want God to judge us. Because what we don't realize is God is perfect. He has nothing wrong. He is perfect. He's holy. So he has to judge sin. All sin. If God was to come and judge right now, man, we'd be in trouble. Please, you know, like, <laughs> this, this is the sin of the garden. To judge others but not judge self. We all want justice. But we don't understand mercy. Why is it taking 2,000 years for him to return? Because of mercy. When he comes, it will, because it will be become... When he comes, it will be for judgment. The reason he tarries... Is because of mercy, wishing that none should perish, but all should return, should turn and repent towards God. That's the will of God. Hmm. So I guess the title is one is not Kingdom Advancement. <laughs> the title of this lesson is going to have to be uh, something else. This one's going to have to be... I never even got to my notes, so... Advancement through submission. It really is about... Um, submission equals power. Submission equals power. Our power comes from submission. So we'll have to pick up at a different time because we. if I keep on going, we'll go for another hour and uh, we'll just have to save this for next time. But God desires, closing remarks, God desires to rule and reign on this earth because he understands also that there is an evil king. The devil is a dictator. The devil rules and reigns by fear. God rules and reigns by empowering others. Look at the disciples. Look at Jesus. When Jesus came, he didn't do all the miracles. He taught his disciples, and they did the miracles. And it wasn't just the twelve. There was one time in the Bible that says there were seventy-two they went out and cast the devils out and healed the sick and raised the dead. Jesus modeled for us what the kingdom is supposed to look like. Authority comes from authority and then we empower those that we serve. Let me say that again. We empower those whom we serve. We're not empowering those whom we rule over. We empower those whom we serve. If you're a leader, you're a servant to those you're leading. And your job is to empower those that you lead. But you're empowering those, but really you're empowering those whom you serve. You're serving them. That's where great power and victory in our life comes from. Amen. Amen. Jesus is awesome. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for ruining my notes and taking over. Just thank you, Father, for your goodness. I worship you. Thank you, Father, that you teach us. I 
how to truly win in life. Thank you, Father. Help us understand servanthood more. Help us understand servanthood more, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this teaching blessed you and, and inspired you and helped you out a little bit. Man, if, if it was a blessing for you, please uh, share the video, like it, leave a comment if you have questions. I'll be, I'll try to answer these questions and whatnot. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Go to our Facebook page and make sure you've already liked the page. Hover your mouse over following and make sure see first is checked. If there's a check mark there, then you know that you'll be seeing our videos in your newsfeed. Also, if you're wanting to support our ministry and help fund missions work and help uh, support drug and alcohol recovery, please go to our website, boldestalignedministries.com or www.balmzs.com and you'll see here there's a donate button. You just hit this donate button right there. It'll give you an opportunity to, to sow into the ministry. Right there, you can see Boulders Line Ministries. You can give 30 bucks a month, $50 a month, or $100 a month, or just a one-time gift if you want. Also, you can go to our website, 3rcandles.com. Remember, all the candles are handmade by our students in recovery, and so you can select from our wide range of products. I mean, we just have tons of candles, you can see right there. And also, be sure to sign up for the VIP offers. We can get 25% off your next purchase. You'll be able to receive offers we have. We're also gonna be doing some free test strips for fragrance as well so make sure that you sign up right here and, and all that good stuff so have a good day